Okay, so just to kind of let you know where this came from, um, I had been, one of my favorite topics is the Bible, the reliability of the Bible, the dependability, you know, the, the Bible is true, especially um, contradictions, the, the alleged, you know, oh, well, this says this and this says that, and that doesn't match, and then, you know, you show, yes, actually it does, because um, there's a lot of criticisms out there, and I enjoy answering those, um, and I was having a conversation about Bible contradictions, and it hit me, because I was trying to think of what we were going to study after we finished uh, the supernatural study. And it hit me, I said, hey, Easter's coming up, let's do something Easter-themed. And there, I know that there are a bunch of supposed contradictions uh, in the uh, crucifixion, arrest, resurrection, you know, that, that whole end of Jesus' life stories that a lot of people like to claim certain um, contradictions. So I thought that would be a great thing to do, and it gave me an excuse to make a neat little picture there. Where you kind of got, you know, it's like left curve, you know, go right, or from you. Yeah. So, uh, which one is it, left or right? And so, and it's the empty tomb. Get it? Yeah. Yeah. See what I did there? Okay. Well, so we're going to be talking about Bible contradictions. Uh oh. What the? Ha. Um, having to do with Easter, because Easter is fast approaching. Now, because I don't just want to throw out um, kind of the low-hanging fruit that sort of the trolls online like to say, I want to make sure that we're looking at some of, I mean, we'll look at some of that stuff because it's just fun, but I want to make sure we look at some of the serious kind of criticisms that go on. And so I'm going to start with, just to give you an idea, this is a gentleman, his name is Dr. Bart Ehrman. He is um, a, a well-known, some people might say leading um, uh, Bible scholar. Uh, he is a professor, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe it is at uh, University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, he, where he teaches uh, textual criticism and Bible, and that's his field, is actually examining the uh, manuscripts. He trained under Bruce Metzger, who was, is widely considered to have been the premier um, uh, scholar on this area. And uh, he, he's no dummy and he's no slouch. He knows his stuff. And most of the things that he will say, uh, like the facts of the Bible, um, are true. You know, even uh, conservative evangelical Bible scholars will agree with a lot of what he says. It's just where his conclusions go. <clears throat> and so you have this guy, and he's written several books, best-selling books. Uh, he is personally agnostic. He was raised evangelical, and then he had a little bit of a crisis of faith and came to the conclusion that the Bible is not true. And so that's kind of his kind of area. He's written several books on the topic of trying to show that the Bible is not presenting any kind of um, reliable uh, teaching about uh, Jesus or religious things. And so, uh, but because of his credentials, which are no small matter, uh, he, he, he's got a platform. People listen to him when he talks. And so uh, this little video I'm going to show is about two and a half, three minutes, but just to kind of give you an idea. This is from a debate that he had with another scholar, Mike Lycona, um, this one is about 10 years old, but I listened to a recent one, and most of the points he's about to bring up, he's mentioned uh, in a more recent debate as well, and they're pretty common fare. So let's just give me an idea of what we're looking at. Simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death, and then read John's account of Jesus' death, and make a list of everything that happens in both, and compare your lists. You will find that there are stunning differences. In fact, there are discrepancies. Let me give you just a list of very quick examples. What day did Jesus die on? That's a simple question. And luckily, we're told in both Mark and John. In Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus died the day after the Passover meal was eaten in Jerusalem. John tells us explicitly, chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus died the day before the Passover meal was eaten, on the day of preparation for the Passover. That's different. He couldn't die both days. What about the time? 
According to Mark, he died at 9 in the morning. According to John, he wasn't, he wasn't condemned to death until afternoon. John 19, 14. These are accounts that differ from one another. Did Jesus carry his cross the entire way to Golgotha, or did Simon of Cyrene carry it? It depends which gospel you read. Did both robbers mock Jesus, or did only one of them mock him and the other come to his defense? It depends which gospel you read. Did the curtain in the temple rip in half before Jesus died, or was it after he died? It depends which gospel you read. I can give you the references for all of these if you need me to, or you can look them up yourself. I'm not making these up. Those are just differences about Jesus' death. What about differences in the accounts of his resurrection? Well, who went to the tomb on the third day? Did Mary Magdalene go alone, or did Mary go with other women? Depends which gospel you read. If with other women, how many of them were there? What were their names, and which ones were they? It depends which gospels you read. Was the stone rolled away before the women got to the tomb or not? What did they see in the tomb? Did they see a man? Did they see two men? Or did they see an angel? Depends which gospel you read. What were they told to tell the disciples? Were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to see Jesus? Or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Did the women tell anybody? Or were they silent about it? Depends which gospel you read. Did the disciples ever leave Jerusalem? Or did they immediately, did they never leave, or did they uh, leave and go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. My conclusion, these are not reliable historical accounts. There are too many discrepancies. Interesting, but you get the idea, right? I mean, this is, this is his job, is studying this stuff. He is a top expert in his field. He has all the weight of his experience, education, and expertise standing behind him as he says these things. I mean, if you're 18, 19, 20-year-old sitting in his Bible class and he's saying these things, not only is he just having to be the professor, but he's got clout behind him. It's pretty convincing to a lot of people. So we are going to kind of go through, look at some of these errors as well as uh, some other sources that I got things from. Um, there are basically two types of errors that we're going to be dealing with. Some of them are differences in the text, right? Where, where this gospel says one thing and this gospel seems to say another. Other type are historical errors, things where um, you know, it seems that what the Bible is saying would contradict something else we know from history some other historical source. <clears throat> Take a quick look. The differences in accounts <clears throat> in the text. We have three basic differences. Um, you have your contradictions. Those are straight out where it says, you know, Bob turned left and this one says Bob turned right. That's a contradiction. Cannot possibly, totally illogical, cannot both be true. That's a contradiction. Is to say that someone did something or someone did the exact opposite. It's a very specific kind of thing. The word contradiction will get thrown around a lot, but not everything that disagrees is a contradiction. Contradiction is where it is explicitly op opposite. You have left out details where you'll have two gospels telling the same story, but why doesn't this author mention these things? That seemed kind of important. And so critics will point at those. You have inconsistencies where details just don't quite seem to match up. Most of what we'll look at, I think, is going to fall in this category. Um, and so we'll see that, you know, even if at first blush they don't seem to match up, they actually do. Historical errors, these are things where um, it doesn't match up with other things we know from history. Often critics will uh, treat the Bible as if it's not historical. I've actually had someone say to me that the Bible is not history, it's a religious book. Well, well no, uh, I mean, it, it's a book that has religious implications, but those are indeed historical documents. You don't really get to get away with claiming that. Um, the New Testament especially, what we're dealing with uh, tonight in the next couple weeks, is uh, I mean, th th these are historical documents. You can't really get around it. 
Okay, the Gospels are um, an, a form of ancient uh, biography. Uh, you, it's called uh, the life. It is, you know, life of so-and-so, called bios, which just means, you know, Greek word for life. But you'd have the life of Julius Caesar or the life of, you know, whoever. But, but it's a style of biography from the ancient world. Not quite the way we do biographies, but we know what kind of genre the Gospels are. The book of Acts... I didn't put it up there, but the book of Acts, I mean, that's straight history, right? Whenever Luke wrote Acts, he is writing, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. It's a record of events. It is history. The epistles, do you know what the word epistle means? That's one of those fancy words that people use. It just means a letter. That's all an epistle is. It's a letter. And letters are written from a specific person, or persons to a specific person or group for a specific purpose. Okay, when the Bible authors sat down to write, I don't think that they had in their mind, I am writing a religious holy book. Whenever Paul sat down to write 1 Corinthians, he was just writing a letter to the church in Corinth. Oh, there's some stuff going on there. I need to straighten them out. Here, let me write them a letter. He, he, he wasn't sitting there having it in his mind that he is writing the Word of God. It's recognized as that now. Right? Whenever um, John actually wrote his gospel according to other sources uh, from like the next generation of church leaders, um, John had to be talked into writing his gospel. Scholars all pretty much agree, secular and Christian, that John was the last gospel written because he had to be convinced to do it. So some, some other friends and disciples said, hey, John, you ain't going to be around forever. Will you write down what happened? So he didn't go, yes, let me write the word of God. He, he was just recording what he experienced with Jesus. Of course, it was God working through him to provide us, but these are historical documents in every sense of the word. If they were, I'm convinced that if these books were not part of an active religion, pressing on people's conscience, no one would care. They would be historical documents. They treat them like they do any other historical document. But because they tend to bug people, then they fight against it. The error that we're going to see as we go along is that the error is in the thinking of the skeptic and of the critic. They challenge... Um, the very fact that we have to come up with these ideas. So as we're going through looking at different contradictions, I've had someone say to me, you know, the fact that you're just having to come up with all these answers just shows how weak the Bible is that you have to make all these excuses for it. Okay, kind of the idea that's being put forth is like Christianity, you know, the, the Bible is, uh, it's like a boat with all these leaks and we're just going around plugging holes when, when actually, no, 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 whenever we show that there's no contradiction, we're not plugging a hole, we're showing there's no hole there at all. A lot of times I'll hear people, even well-intending Christians, and I've even done it myself, refer to um, uh, the answers to these contradiction questions as a solution. I don't think that's a good word, because it's not a solution. There's no problem to be solved. That's the whole point. Whenever critics come and they say, here's a contradiction, and we give an answer, we're not solving a problem. We're pointing out there is no problem at all. And every time one of these allegations fail, it strengthens the reliability of the Bible. And so, as we go through these, every one that we knock down, as we knock them down and show that they're not really a problem, should bolster your understanding and trust in the reliability of the Bible. Now, quickly, a few things to keep in mind. Because some of these are things that people tend to just get wrong whenever they're approaching the, the subject. I'm going to go through these pretty quick because um, they're basic and clock's ticking. Bible authors sometimes paraphrase. You realize that Jesus was teaching for three, three and a half years, and even if they were sitting there with pen and paper, they're not going to get word for word but they got it over and over again over time. So whenever they write down um, something that happened, they're not necessarily quoting word for word exactly every little syllable in detail. But they got the 
the message. Um, biblical authors use different witnesses for the same events. Right? Matthew was an eyewitness, John was an eyewitness, but Luke and Mark got their information from Peter and, in case of Luke, other people. So they're getting different takes on the same events. And you actually have where, uh, like in a court of law, detectives, if witnesses' testimonies match up exactly, that's a big red flag that they're lying. It's contrived, it's made up, right? It's rehearsed, they're lying. And so the fact that the gospel authors would tell the same story with slightly different details is actually a strength of the gospels. Biblical authors did not always put things in order. And that's really annoying. But that's how we think. That's not how they thought. And whenever they would be writing, they have a point they're trying to make. And if you're writing the story of Jesus over three years worth of teaching, and you're saying, okay, um, you're coming to a point where he's telling some parables, where you just group all the parables that have a similar theme. But maybe he didn't tell all those parables all in that order at that time. You know, you remember he told it here, and he told this one here, and he told that one there, but they all got grouped. Those sorts of things happen in the Gospels. They're not as concerned with precision as much as accuracy. You understand those are two different things? You can be accurate to what happened without being precise on the specific detail. And so the Gospel authors, those historians back then, whenever they wrote, they were being accurate, but they didn't always have the precision that we tend to like. Sometimes Bible authors compress a story. That, that is where they'll take a long period of time, events that unfold over days, and maybe they'll tell it all real quick. The book of Mark is very, um, scholars have noticed that, that he uses this transitional word immediately, constantly. Then immediately they went and did this. And then immediately Jesus went here. And then immediately the disciples, well, he doesn't, that doesn't actually mean immediately. Because we're talking three years worth of ministry. But if you totaled up ever all of the immediately's, you'd have about maybe three months' worth of events, you know, in the book of Mark. He compressed it, right? It, it, uh, Luke does the same thing in a few places where he takes, like, a whole, you know, day's worth of events, but it seems like it all happened real quick. That was common for them. Might bug us. That's how they often wrote. Uh, these teachings were spoken more than once. So, so again, if whenever um, Matthew is writing something, He's coming to mind whenever Jesus was teaching it over here. But then whenever, uh, say, Mark was getting his information from Peter, Peter was thinking of the time Jesus taught it over here. Yeah, guys, th there's stories I've told from the pulpit three, four, five times, and I never told them the same way twice. G Jesus didn't always say things always exactly the same, and so maybe they're re remembering details different. And lastly, this may shock you, but... Bible critics sometimes take verses out of context. Sometimes that's on accident because they're not real good at biblical interpretation. They're not trained in that. They're not real schooled in that. Sometimes it's on purpose. I, I've seen people who have flat out, there is no way you could possibly think a verse meant what they're trying to say. They are cherry picking. I've even seen them where they go and they pick a specific translation because that translation fits the point they're trying to make. But no other translation says it that way. But they'll go find the one that fits them. So sometimes that sort of thing happens. So again, we are looking main, mainly, our two main sources are Bart Ehrman, all those that he gave in that video. And I'm sorry it kind of uh, cut out on us. But, and then there's a website called infidels.org. This is one of the biggest websites for atheists to go and get information about why the Bible is wrong and Christianity is false. Um, it's one of the most popular. Um, and so I pulled stuff off of there. And then there's some other things. I just know people have said it, and it's fun. So I include that. And so that is where we stand. Any questions before we launch in and try to cram three contradictions in 20 minutes. Okay. We're in no hurry. If we don't get through everything I had planned for tonight, then we'll just pick it up next week. On infidels.org, it says, before listing the contradictions regarding the trials of Jesus, it should be stated that the whole episode is quite obviously a fabrication. 
Anyone familiar with the Jewish law recognizes the impossibility of the chief priests and scribes arresting Jesus and assembling to question him during the most holy of Jewish festivals. Now, there's two words in here, two statements that should automatically jump out at you that someone may be being dishonest. Anytime, and I've probably even done it myself, it's easy to fall into it. If anyone ever tells you that it's quite obviously something, well, is it really quite obviously? Maybe to them, that's what they think, and so that's what they're saying, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is so. It also doesn't mean it's impossible. This is a very subjective, very opinionated statement because it's actually just as um, in keeping, right? It's highly unusual for, you know, Jews to do something like this on a holy day. Okay, I'll grant that. But being highly unusual doesn't mean it's impossible, doesn't mean it's fabricated. In fact, the, I, the fact that it is highly unusual is in keeping with the biblical account that the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jews are self-righteous hypocrites that are power-hungry and they're trying to keep their position and they're wanting to shut Jesus down because he's making problems. It makes perfect sense that that kind of person would do something like this. And so, no, that's not quite obviously a fabrication. It quite obviously fits with the Bible story. So anytime someone's making these severe declarations of this is the way it must be, a little red flag should go off. Okay, where was Jesus taken immediately after his arrest? Okay, um, and I think I gave you uh, some of these where was Jesus taken immediately after his arrest? Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that Jesus was taken directly to the high priest. Whereas, oops, John says that Jesus was taken first to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest. So which was it? Was he taken to Annas or was he taken to the high priest, Caiaphas? Well, here are, and I gave you this little table in your notes there, some little side-by-side -side comparison. Right? In Matthew 26, it flat out says, those who laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. Um, Mark and Luke are so kind of detailed comparison to Matthew. It, they would, it, even though they don't specifically name Caiaphas, it's assumed very reasonably that they're, that's what they intend because the wording is almost identical in several places. So they're telling the same story that Matthew told. But John said that they led him away to Annas first. So which was it? Could be. Could be living in the same house. We'll actually get to that in uh, a, another issue that gets brought up. But specifically on this one, you always have to notice here, let, let, me, let me bring pull this uh, idea. If we go back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that Jesus was taken directly to the high priest. Do you see the word directly anywhere in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? No. It's not there. He inserted that. Right? Maybe he thinks that's what it means, but it does not say that. All it says is they arrested him and they took him to Caiaphas. But John, which by the way, who was written after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and probably knows what it is that they say, he inserts in his that as they led him away to Annas first. So we don't have a contradiction, we have a clarification. John is kind of clarifying the flow of events and what happened. Now, what's really interesting is uh, some people have pointed out that in Mark and Luke, where it says that he was taken to the high priest. Well, who's the high priest? Is it Annas or is it Caiaphas? Well, the answer is yes, both. Well, that can't be. You can only have one high priest. It only takes a little bit of study. Nowadays, we have this thing called Google. It only takes about two minutes on Google to find out, you know, this information. But according to Roman historian Josephus, not a Christian, he is a Jew who was uh, uh, in, in the pay of the Romans as a historian. Okay, so not a biased source. 
but he points out in his history of the Jews that um, in about 17 or 18 AD, the Romans um, kicked out Annas. Annas was the high priest. But Rome stepped in and said, no, we don't like you, had him removed and appointed someone else as high priest. And so fast forward to the time of Jesus, and the person who happens to be the high priest at this time is Caiaphas, who Rome has appointed. But Josephus points out that Annas still held a lot of sway and power, and there was a lot among the Jews who still viewed him as the rightful high priest. And, interestingly, we also learn in other sources that he had such clout and power, four of his own sons served as high priest at some point, as, as well as Caiaphas, his son-in-law. This guy had some power. He had the political clout, he had the social standing, that he was able to call the shots and be involved, to stay involved in the politics such that a lot of people still refer to him as uh, the high priest. <clears throat> Indeed, and I didn't put in your notes, so I don't have a slide. Do I have a slide? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, Luke chapter 3, verse 2 um, is describing a bunch of things that happened, is trying to give some dates and some times, but it mentions the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Mentions them both together as being high priests. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John coming before the Sanhedrin, it says, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and many who were of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. So, so in the book of Acts, after Jesus, Annas hasn't been high priest for 15, 16, 17 years at this point, 18 years at this point but it's still referring to him as high priest. He's still recognized in some fashion as being the high priest. So, all right. Any thoughts, questions on that? I think it just jumped right out that it doesn't say directly. So, so actually the uh, events that we get, which by the way, I gave you a parallel that has Matthew and Luke and John to kind of show how they match up and where things happen. Uh, the verses are not going to match up because Microsoft changed the verse numbers into like list numbers, and so it adjusted the numbers, so the verse numbers aren't right on that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that will kind of show you that what happened was Jesus was arrested, he was taken to Annas's house, and then uh, later he was sent to Caiaphas. That, uh, simple. No contradiction going on at all. Okay. Um, da, da, da. Ah, see, there we go. I did it. Directly. There was no directly. Two high priests. I had all that in there. Looky there. All right. Next one. When did the priests and scribes gather together to question Jesus? According to Matthew 26, it says that on the night that Jesus was arrested, the priests and scribes were gathered together prior to Jesus being brought to the high priest. But Mark 14 says that the priests and scribes were gathered together on the night of Jesus' arrest after Jesus was brought to the high priest. And Luke 22 says that the priests and scribes were assembled the day after Jesus was arrested. And John only mentions the high priest. He doesn't mention anybody else being there. Well, as I've already stated, how many events are we dealing with here? Right, whenever it says that he's taken to the high priest, which high priest? Uh, both of them. Two different events. One, he's with Annas. Another, he's with Caiaphas. So John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all recording different events. John records Jesus with Annas, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke refer to Jesus before Caiaphas. So there can't be a contradiction between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John because John's talking about a whole different event. It's not even the same place, not even the same time. Okay? He says that only the high priest... Well, only the high priest is the one who does any talking. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, only the high priest does any talking. Does that mean that no one else but the high priest was there? No. It doesn't. But that's all he records because that's the only person that talks. That's what was important in the event was the conversation had with the high priest. So was it before or after? It mentions that um, in in Matthew it says that they were gathered before Jesus got there, and in Mark it says that they were gathered after Jesus got there. Could be both. It's a crowd of people. It's the middle of the night or early, early morning. Maybe not everybody got there at the same time. Maybe, maybe some were already gathered and the rest showed up later. But you notice... Nowhere in here, and you should have this in your notes, nowhere in here does it say before or after. Doesn't say it. The, the person who made up this contradiction is reading it into the text. They're reading their own assumptions. And this is very dependent on translations. I meant to get uh, several translations lined up where you can actually see how the wording of the English can imply a before or after. What's the real message? They brought Jesus somewhere and the people gathered. Before, after, both, during. They came together. That's the point. There is no contradiction. Okay. So was it daytime or nighttime? Because um, he said that Luke says the priests and scribes assembled the day after Jesus. But the others say that it was the night time, right after his arrest. So which was it? Was it day or was it night? Well, come on. Y'all been answering so good. How many events are we dealing with? Two. At one time, he's appearing before Annas. At another time, he's appearing before Caiaphas. So did they gather at night or did they gather during the day? Yes, both, right? There's nothing in here that says that, um, that, that, that there's a contradiction. Now, one, he's meeting with Caiaphas. The other, he's meeting with Annas. So again, the series of events, he's arrested. It's late at night, maybe midnight or so, somewhere around there, middle of the night. And he's taken to Annas and then... As morning comes, he's taken to Caiaphas. Done. I mean, there's, there's nothing here. So, all right. Any thoughts, questions, comments? I didn't mean to just get up here and preach. I mean, I want there to be some interaction. You are giving some good interaction when you do. All right. Okay, so he was rested late night, taking Annas. Was Jesus questioned by Herod? Again, remember I said one of the types of uh, inconsistencies that people will point out is missing details or left out details. So he says that Luke says that Pilate sent Jesus to Herod who questioned Jesus at length and then returned Jesus to Pilate. Matthew, Mark, and John make no mention of Herod. This in itself means nothing, but it brings about another contradiction later, which we'll get to next week. But can you find the answer? He gave it himself. This itself means nothing. It, it means nothing. So Luke records it and the others don't. Okay. That means nothing. Now, it may seem kind of odd. Well, why wouldn't they record that? That seems like it might be important. Well, okay, it may seem that way to us. They disagreed. Each, each of the four Gospels has independent information that the other three do not record. That does not mean it didn't happen. There's actually all kinds of uh, major events in history that, we, I mean, us looking back, we would think, wow, why would you not record that? Whenever... Um, Mount Vesuvius erupted. Uh, there were two major cities that got wiped out. 
there is a Roman historian, uh, I want to say it's Plutarch, but I, don't quote me on that. Um, he records in detail the eruption, does not mention the cities getting destroyed, which is kind of weird because he had relatives in one of them. Does that mean those cities weren't destroyed? No. Why didn't he record that? I don't know. Yeah. Could be. Right? That he was not with them every minute, everywhere he was taken. So, remember, Luke, who's the one that records the journey to Herod, um, he's getting his information from witnesses. He's interviewing people, and so maybe he's talking to someone who did follow, who was there. And um, you know, maybe the others weren't, and so they didn't record details they didn't know about. I, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can think up to why they didn't. But the important thing is, it doesn't really matter, even as he points out. We got one last one I gave you no notes for, but because I found it myself. Um, any, any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Um, Y'all might, maybe I can notice this. I tried to do the parallel, or maybe it would stand out. As I was making that parallel that I gave you, this jumped out at me. And I thought, wow, this one actually seems like a contradiction. Why is it not on the list? Um, where was Peter when he denied Jesus? Was he in the courtyard of Annas' house, like John says? Or was he in the courtyard outside of Caiaphas' house? Like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because John records Jesus with Annas. Sorry, I got those backwards. Yeah. John records Jesus with Annas. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record Jesus with Caiaphas. All four of them record Peter's denial as he's standing outside while Jesus is on trial. So where was it? Alan knew the answer to this one, but he blurted it out early. Both. They live in the same house. There's actually several possibilities. One is there's two locations. Yeah, they could share a courtyard. I mean, there's two, po there, uh, one possibility that's been offered by some people is there's two locations. He denies, well, you know, over here, and then he follows Jesus, and then two more denials over here. Mm -hmm possible. I don't know that it really seems to fit that in the text. Um, the one that I tend to favor is that Peter didn't go anywhere. Peter stayed right there in that same courtyard, and maybe it was two different houses that had a common area between them. Maybe, remember, Annas is a powerful public figure who apparently has a big powerful family, it's not outside of reason that he would have a family estate, palace, house, whatever you want to call it, and that Caiaphas would also be there. Maybe visiting. Maybe he lives there. But it's altogether possible that they, brought, they first brought Jesus to Annas. I mean, because he may not have the official title, but he's the one with the power. So they bring him to him. But then for the official trial, they take him over to Caiaphas, but Caiaphas is in the same house. So whenever it says that they sent Jesus to Caiaphas, they didn't send him across town, right? They, they sent him down the hall. Meanwhile, Peter is still outside in the courtyard denying Jesus. He never, he never went anywhere. Do I know for a fact that's what happened and that's how it is? No, I don't know that. But here we have several options. Two different locations, one option is that, remember, a first century kind of historian, they don't really mind with rearranging events some. So maybe they, you know, they just thought it doesn't matter exactly where he was standing. They weren't focusing on, you know, which house is he standing outside of. They just wanted to make sure it got recorded. You know, that might drive our precision-focused minds nuts, but maybe they wouldn't care so much. There's one option. Another option is two locations. He denied once over here. They went across town over here and he denied it two more times. You know, maybe another option is that they're in the same house and Peter never went anywhere. They just moved Jesus down the hall. 
And another option is, it's a contradiction. Okay, now, why is that one, the contradiction, the far more reasonable intelligence? No, I mean, no we, we have other options that are just as reasonable, perfectly intelligible, and given the way families and things functioned back then, right? I mean, you, you didn't go graduate, go off to college, and never move back home. You tended to stay together of multiple generations in a house. So it's actually rather feasible that they could be in the same location. There's no reason to think that the most rational option is that it must be a contradiction. And so, once again, there is no problem. We're not running around making up excuses. We're not trying to give solutions to problems. We're pointing out there is no problem. There's no contradiction. There's no inconsistency. It's just the Bible telling the story with different authors giving different perceptions. I think a lot of times what happens in these contradiction issues is it's kind of like an optical illusion, but it's in the perception because of some preconceived bias or whatever they have going on, they look at it and they go, ooh, that looks like a contradiction. But just like with an optical illusion, you get up closer and you realize, oh, wait a minute, okay, I see what's going on. Right, like whenever the road ahead looks like it's got a puddle on it, but then you get closer and it's not, it's dry, it was the oil and, you know, optical illusion. But when you get closer, you figure it out. Same thing. I think it's like an optical illusion. As skeptics look at the Bible, they automatically see oh, it's a contradiction. But now, as we've looked, you look closer and you realize, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't it at all. There is no problem. There is no contradiction. The Bible continues to stand up to the test. So, all right. Thoughts? Comments? Questions? In the uh, video that messed up on us that we didn't get to finish. He actually gives, I think it's 11 or 12, and we'll get into all of them, plus a few more. So we've probably got a couple more weeks of looking at this, and I'm going to try to expect you all to get a little more involved and help me solve them over the next couple weeks. So, Who? Uh, Bart Ehrman. I think it's E-H-R-M-A-N. Very popular skeptic um, Bible scholar. So, never can remember if it's E R H or E H R. I think it's E H R, M A N. So, all right. I'm done. Y'all got any questions? No? Okay.